to the Power Factor Show. Episode 159. Sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. Hi, welcome to Power Factor. I'm Larry, and uh, this is the uh, another installment in a series of start positions for uh, USPSA, and I suppose it could also apply to IDPA, although I'm not really up on their new rule book and everything else. So uh, um, this is uh, uh, being delivered to you from a USPSA perspective, and um, probably you can apply this to IDPA. So uh, this week we're talking about table starts, and that's uh, with your gun on the table. So you see here we've got several um, guns here just to talk about different things um, related to starting uh, a stage with the gun on the table. So you walk up and you get your written stage briefing and it says gun starts on the table. Uh, now pay close attention to exactly what the written stage briefing says. Most of the time, from a shooter's perspective, definitely pay attention. I mean most of the time it's going to say uh, with the gun laying flat and unsupported. So what that means is basically what you're seeing right here with all these guns. They're all laying on the side and um, unsupported. There's nothing, there's nothing here to, to prop the gun up artificially uh, so that it makes it easier to grab onto. Um, it's it's going to have to just be laying flat on the table. Um, one thing uh, you'll notice is that uh, I've got them all unloaded. Also pay attention, of course, it'll be very obvious, the RO will not let you start if the gun's loaded and it's not supposed to be. So loaded or unloaded are the two options there. And um, if the gun is to be, to start unloaded, unloaded is defined as slide forward, hammer down, and no ammunition in the gun. Now if if there's ammunition in the magazine and the magazine is in the gun, that is a loaded firearm. Uh, even if there's not a round in the chamber, by definition, the magazine inside the gun means the gun's loaded. So that can't can't do that either if it is a unloaded start. So um, how do you place the gun and um, and where do you place the mag? It all depends on. Uh, several things. So first of all, obviously, if you're right-handed, you want the gun uh, placed so that your right hand is on the proper side of the gun. You don't want to obvious, obviously you don't want to put the gun upside down and have to flip it over first. So that's that's obvious. But also, what I would say equally obvious is that the magazine, when you pull a magazine off your belt, your your finger rides along the front the front edge of the magazine, the front side of the magazine to guide it into the gun. Well, reverse the process. Take the magazine out of the gun, place the mag on the table so that natural motion shows you that the bullets should be pointing up, up to the sky. And that's, um, you would think that's pretty obvious, but I see, I've seen folks, um, especially newer shooters that are Probably already, you know, a little amped up, a little frazzled um, about people watching them shoot, and I've, I see people, you know, just get their magazines and just kind of put them, however, on the table. I mean, really, really think about um, what you're about to do for the stage. Do you just need the one mag to come off the table, and all the other magazines are on your belt? Does the written stage briefing say that all magazines are to be on the table before the start buzzer? And so that's. Those are things to consider when you're placing your magazines. Um, you know, maybe you've got, maybe you're shooting production and you've got eight shots that you have to shoot from this box I'm standing in before you go take off running. So, um, you know, you might want, you might be required to have all of your magazines on the table. So have, you know, the second magazine 
in a, in a, in a place that you're not going to disturb its position because you've positioned it exactly how you want it. So you're going to pick up the gun, load the gun, shoot your 10 rounds, and then eject that mag and immediately grab the next mag before you get going. So all things to consider. Now, um, as far as placing the gun on the table, let's clear some of these things out of the way here. And we'll just deal with the one gun right here. So this is my Glock 35 that I'm most accustomed to, to working with. Um, the written stage briefing typically, and now speaking to the, the stage designers and match directors, I like to have an X on the table that's usually just made with tape, you know, your target tape. Just make a little X. And I typically like to say when I'm designing a stage, place the trigger guard on the X and the muzzle pointed directly downrange, whether it's loaded or unloaded. But um, that way, it's, uh, it, everybody starts the same way. And nobody can say that, um, you know, so-and-so got an advantage, or I wish I would have thought of that, or what have you. That, that clears up a lot of questions. If you say trigger guard on the X, and I, and I, like, and I put the trigger guard where I can see the intersection of the X of the tape, through the trigger guard and then muzzle directly downrange as is, is, is straight downrange as you can get it as an RO if it looks good you know it's good to go you know if the first targets over here and the shooter wants to put his gun over there and he wants to start facing that target well if it says directly downrange just remind the shooter to point the gun directly downrange like this now what about um, uh, like we talked about you could have a loaded start you could have an unloaded start what do you do with your magazine if it's unloaded? Well, I kind of already covered this, but like I say, put it in a position where it's close to the gun so you don't have to move very far to get the ammunition to the gun, but also have it in a way that's a natural position for your wrist. And so whatever feels natural, get started like this before the start buzzer when you're positioning your stuff, and then you're ready to go. So when the start buzzer beeps, my my process is to um, I like to pick up the gun like this. You'll notice you might notice my thumb is straight up on the back of the gun. That's easy to do with a Glock with the with the flat um, uh, back of the slide is flat there. But you know it's kind of hard to jam your thumb underneath. But some people do. Um, I don't want to risk. I typically don't recommend doing that because I don't want to risk getting a splinter in my finger or uh, you know, seriously hurting my thumb, or at least, you know, it might, it might hurt for just a minute or two, but your stage is over in, you know, 20 seconds or whatever it is. So you don't want your thumb throbbing or, or, or something distracting you while you're, while you're shooting the stage. So I generally come down straight on top of the gun, pick it up and load it like this in the same, the same angle as if I was just performing a reload in the middle of the stage. So once again, that looks like this. And after I've picked up the gun, my thumb wraps around after it clears the table. Now, there's um, a couple of ways to game this. Now, speaking to the shooters, again, um, if the match director or the stage designer didn't specifically tell you exactly uh, what to do with your gun, now let's say it still says lying flat and unsupported, so we can't artificially I've seen you know people uh, put a magazine underneath the gun like this if it doesn't say you can't do that if it doesn't say flat and unsupported you can so pay close attention shooters and uh, by all means game it if they've allowed you to game it and this will let you get the gun up off the table just that much quicker but now let's say that they've they've they think they've thought of everything and it says flat and unsupported so there you go, the gun is flat and unsupported. Now there's a couple of ways you can game this. I've seen shooters set the magazine like this. And this is a, a variation of picking up the gun like um, the one technique I showed you already where you come down on top of the gun and, and pick up like this and my thumb wraps around. The second technique that you'll see quite a lot, and this is for you to decide what you like better, is the scoop technique where I kind of I come up and, and get my left hand, my support hand, underneath the slide and lift it into my firing hand. 
that is the uh, that's the second way of doing that. Now, if the gun is unloaded at the start, I don't generally like to do that because that keeps my left hand busy working with the gun when it should be working with the magazine. So I think that's an added step. But if it is a loaded start and the gun's on the table, that is an option for you to come down and lift it into your hand, use your support hand to get the gun off the table. Um, let me see. So, like I was saying here, so here's there's a position, an unloaded start position that uh, you'll see some people gaming, where you've got, especially when you've got a big magazine well like this, um, you can at the start buzzer, and I don't do this ever. So, here we go. Let's see if it works. <laughs> it didn't work, <laughs> but anyway, you get the idea where the magazine is just outside of the uh, outside of the gun and. The uh, you know if, if I is as a as a range officer if someone's going to attempt to do this I want to be able to see vertically maybe I'll take my overlay and run it right down here outside the magwell to be sure that the magazine is not in the gun at the start so this is legal an unloaded start there's light there's a plane here between the gun and the magazine that someone you know, could jam these two things together and um, start like that. Again, I don't really care for it. Now, there's a third technique that's, um, I'm not recommending it, but I've seen it done, where this is your unloaded start. If you've got a uh, magazine with a base pad that is perpendicular, square to the mag body, and the magazine will therefore stand straight up, if you have to do something else with your weak hand, if you have to, you know, pick something up, carry something, I don't know. I've seen this technique where the where the magazine the gun is jammed down on top of the magazine. Now you still have to rack the slide. Um, there are ways that you will think that you can game that and 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 get some advantage. I would recommend not doing that unless you have practiced it a thousand times and you know that you can hit it every time and you know that it's going to work for you every time. Um, my go-to unloaded table start position is just like this with the magazine right there. It's it's this, like I say, it's the same motion that you do when you're loading the gun in the middle of a stage, and I think that works the best. Um, another way to game this uh, unloaded start is where to place the gun on the table. Now, again, I say I'm speaking to the stage designers and match directors. I like to say on the X, trigger guard on the X, muzzle pointed directly downrange. If it doesn't say that, shooters, you could put the gun. Oftentimes, you'll also hear the written stage brief and say, completely within the confines of the table or something like that. So if I run an overlay or something along the edge of the table, I'm not going to touch the gun. But you can put it anywhere on the table in that case, right? If they didn't say there's a if there's an X or something. So, you know, put it closer to you and if if the gun is not if most of the weight is up front and if it doesn't tell me where, I could put the gun like this. I don't know if you can tell, it's hanging off my entire rear sight. My entire rear sight is hanging off the back of the table. The magwell here is barely on the table. So on the start position here is a lot easier to get your hand around the gun when the, almost the entire grip is available. Now again, this is somewhat hazardous, somewhat risky, so be sure that you've got most of the weight up front here. Um, so the center of gravity is on the table. Now if I had a fully loaded magazine, which I don't, I have one snap cap here, but if it was a loaded start, that's going to change where the gun balances. So this is risky. Um, you can drop the gun, which is disqualification at best. Worst case is uh, you've, uh, you've got the gun on the ground and it actually discharges. So it is risky. Um, be sure that you know what you're doing. Uh, maybe uh, I would say not for beginners, but that's another way to game your table start stage. Um, if they didn't tell you where to put it, bring it back here where it's easier to get your get your hand around it. Um, what about the shooter? Well, let's talk about the gun some more. So this is a uh, this is a limited gun. 
USPSA limited gun. It's got the magwell um, and the extended magazines. Same applies for a production gun. I would do the same thing. Bullets pointed up. That's a snap cap. Unloaded gun. Hammer down, slide forward. That's unloaded. And uh, same thing with that. Now what about, here's another production gun, but what about your open guns? We have here a USPSA open division race gun with what we call the big stick, 170 millimeter magazine. And you'll see that on this particular one, we've got a thumb rest. If you guys have ever seen a thumb rest, experienced shooters will have seen that, new shooters maybe not. This is attached to the scope mount and your support thumb falls right on that thumb rest. So that is going to change how your gun lies flat and unsupported on the table. Is that legal? Yes it is because it's part of the gun. It's, it's attached permanently to the gun. It's not something that's going to be removed. Uh, it's there all the time. So how does that, just that thumb rest, how does it change the way the gun lies on the table? Well. With it unloaded, you can see that we've got the muzzle pointed up in the air on this particular one. Let's see what we got with the magazine in the gun. We've got something similar going on there. The muzzle's pointed up in the air. So that's not really, that's not advantageous to getting your thumb around the gun when, um, when it's, it's, it's cranked around, you know, it's, it's, it's worse than flat if the muzzle's up. So, you will see a lot of these guns have a slide racker which is attached typically to a dovetail and it sticks out, I don't know, half inch, three quarters of an inch and it facilitates racking of the slide because it's difficult to get your your hand around the Seymour scope which is a most popular scope. Um, a lot of folks will have a slide racker. Now that will help keep the back corner of the gun, the back of the slide up off the table and help you get your hand around the gun. Now again that is a permanently attached part and that's legal to do so. Now here's a little trick on this gun. There is a uh, Double Alpha Academy uh, modification here to the Seymour scope. There's a top plate here that gets replaced and there is a wing. You see this little wing here. It's hinged, it moves, but it is a permanent part of the gun. So how does that change the way the gun sits on the table? Beautiful. Exactly what you want. Uh, like I say, legal to have because it's permanently attached to the gun. It's uh, so you, on a table start you lift that up and now I mean I don't know if you can tell there's clearance under the gun so a lot easier to scoop that up off the table. Um, that's a good option for you if you're going to shoot open. Um, what else to talk about? Yes, I got a couple of pitfalls for you to watch out for. And they are, let's show you the Glock again, the Glock 35. Let's say we got a loaded start. And in limited division, limited 10, open division, you are allowed to have an extended aftermarket magazine button. So how does that change how the gun sits on the table? You'll see that the gun is rolled over a bit this direction. I don't know if you can tell. We've got a black gun on a black table. But um, the reason why is the gun is sitting on the magazine button. So if you've got a loaded start and you're coming up on the gun, if you mash the gun into the table Look at that, I just released my magazine and if it was heavy and fully loaded it would probably drop out or on the first shot the vibration would knock the magazine out of the gun. Let me show you that again. So on the start buzzer I come down and if I push down on the gun you see the magazine popped out. Not a good thing. So be very careful about that. Um, Again, that's why I come up on the gun. I don't mash down on it. I just get my fingers around it, index finger up on the frame, my thumb, on, in this case, on this gun, my thumbs are on the back of the slide and I wrap around as I pick the gun up. Let's talk about my Beretta here. Um, 
most of my guns, and I'm able to switch back and forth fairly seamlessly, but most guns I've shot, being HKs, Berettas, and uh, STIs like this open gun here, on most every gun I've shot, I've put the magazine release button on the right side. If, you're, if you are a, um, a right-handed shooter, um, it might feel weird at first, but I like it. I've been doing that for you know, 10, 11, 12 years. And in this case, the Beretta uh, magazine button is reversible. It's not ambi, it's on one side or the other, but you can remove it and switch it over. Uh, for me, I, as you can see, I hit the magazine release button with my middle finger. And when the gun sits on the table, no amount of mashing down on the table is going to pop that button. In this case, the button's pretty stiff. So even if I was to hit the button with my hand as I'm coming after the gun, I'm not going to accidentally push that gun, uh, that button. So that's an advan That's one advantage to doing this, uh, doing it this way. Um, your mileage may vary. <laughs> uh, for the STI platform, uh, when I was shooting that, I have a uh, Mitchell. Uh, Mitchell Custom from BulletWorks.com, Mitchell Custom Right Side Magazine Release. It's uh, something that Lisa Munson showed you on the episode that uh, when we had her on, she likes them too uh, for the same reason. I mean, that, that button is so light, it's, it's uh, a bit more than a gesture, but that's about it for me. I mean, I hit the button right here with this knuckle of my middle finger. But um, that's something that you have to be a little bit careful on on the table start if your button is that light but I I can say that I I don't believe I ever had a problem with it so uh, that I think pretty much covers the position of the gun what to do with the gun oh one more for you um, the reason I have this one out here if if the uh, if the start position is loaded that helps if it's loaded especially with the Glock with its square um, front of the magazine base pad. But this is what we used to do when I was in Florida. Here's the gun on the table. If it just says gun on table and you can do that, and it doesn't say lying flat and unsupported, and if it doesn't say, um, uh, you know, if it doesn't stipulate anything about how you do that. Now, why is it not standing up for me? It did a minute ago. But there you go, gun's on the table. How's that for gaming? So, here's my start position. Stand by, beep, just scoop up the gun. So, uh, another way for you to game that. However, match directors, stage designers, I highly recommend for uh, consistency and to, to, to rule out any questions, because that's the last thing you need is a, is a squad to get stalled uh, for 10 minutes while they're trying to find the range master or the match director to say, oh, can Joe Bob wants to do this, can he do that? Um, I really do recommend putting an X on the table and saying muzzle directly down range. That erases all questions. That pretty much satisfies. Um, uh, and there's pretty much no way to game that. So um, anyway, as far as uh, the shooter goes, um, it's pretty simple if, if it says standing naturally then your your start position is going to be standing naturally like you always would be if it doesn't say it's deep by default hands relax at sides oftentimes there will be uh, marks on the table and it says you know hands on the marks um, if that's what it says that's what you got to do um, as far as gaming that if it doesn't say how you put your hands on the marks I recommend not putting your full palm on the marks because the table might be wet you might get some pine needles or some other junk on your hands that will that will distract you while you're shooting so if it just says hands touching the marks just put your fingertips just put a couple of fingertips on there and, uh, and keep your hands clean so that when it's time to shoot you're not distracted by wet hands garbage on your hands or whatever else but if it says palms on the marks you got to follow through with the written stage briefing and put your full palms on the marks sometimes i'll even on the uh, start buzzer do a quick wipe on my pants as i'm about to pick the gun up because i know i got junk on there and it just will distract me so anyway um hopefully that's uh, uh a good lesson for you uh um 
beginner and intermediate shooters. That's you know our target audience audience for these shows, and hopefully some of that helped you out. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week. So I'm Rick, and I'm back with my shirt with another uh, little quick tip about hand loading. If you're uh, if you paid attention to our hand loading episodes that we did, it was a three part episode. We went at length into various aspects of hand loading. Uh, one of the things we touched on was load development and how your charge weight uh, correlates with your velocity. And there's a couple of issues. Um, most powders that you'll use, you'll have a little bit of leeway in terms of charge weight to, to fine tune your load for accuracy or power factor. So for instance, most of my loading I do in 45 auto for either uh, USPSA single stack, limited 10, or uh, IDPA custom defensive pistol. And so the power factor I'm loading to is a minimum of 165, but you always want a little bit of a safety uh, factor there. So I generally load um, to about 170, although I have gotten away in the past with loads that only went about 168. That's cutting it pretty close. Um, I have found uh, in my experience that my chronograph and the chronographs of every person I know will always read at a little bit higher velocity than the chronographs that are at any matches I attend. So if at home, it goes 168. If I go out to Eastern Washington or down to Oregon or fly down to Texas or Arizona, their chronos, it's gonna go about 166. So I hate, there's so many things you have to concern yourself with at a match. Everything from your strategy to your equipment to waking up on time. One of the things that I absolutely do not want to worry about is, is my ammo going to make power factor? The only time I've failed to make power factor in 15 years of competition was when I flew to a match um, where my ammo inexplicably went about 150 power factor, even though it had tested 168 or 169 at home. And I'm not really sure what happened there. It was very weird. I'd used that same load before, used it after, um, and it always made power factor at home, but I went down to Arizona and it wasn't even close. And um, so again, one of the things that's within your power to take kind of off your list of things to worry about is your load by loading with that safe margin. So if you're shooting major, about 170 power factor. If you're shooting minor, about 130. Although oftentimes uh, guns uh, that are chambered, say a nine millimeter, will run a little more reliably if you bump the power factor up a little bit. So even running more like 135, which is what I usually use for 38 Super. When I'm shooting in uh, enhanced service pistol, I usually shoot a single stack uh, 40 or 1911 chambered in 38 Super. Um, one of my favorite loads is a 135 grain bullet at 1,000 feet per second for a 135 power factor, and that works great. Um, and getting any lower, I think the gun starts to get kind of sluggish. So one of the things you want to do is when you're developing your load is pick a powder that does give you a little bit of wiggle room. You don't want to be right up at the maximum charge weight for a given bullet weight and find, geez, I'm not still not quite at my power factor. So pick a round bullet combination of powder and bullet that kind of puts you in the middle of uh, a powder's kind of a sweet zone so that you have some room to move up and down. You don't want to be down near uh, the suggested starting load um, and you don't want to be necessarily up near the maximum load when you're kind of fiddling with this zone that you're going to work in between the minimum power floor of 125 or 165 and then where you want to be. So for instance, the load that I've been using for years in custom defensive pistol and single stack uses a 200 grain bullet and a maximum charge of Hodgdon Clay's powder. Um, while it's perfectly acceptable, I'm getting good consistent velocities and whatnot, it doesn't leave me any room. I can't increase my charge weight if I want to go a few feet per second faster. I'd have to either change to a heavier bullet and go with a lower powder charge, or I'd have to go with a slower burning powder so that I'm not at the maximum charge weight at my desired velocity. Now, when you're adjusting your powder measure, you have to take into account the fact that you're measuring the powder through, through the automatic powder measure on a progressive press or a manually operated powder measure um, if you've got a single stage press. 
and then you're checking your charge weights on a scale. I use a beam scale. A lot of people today with electronic stuff being as affordable as it is, they've got an electronic scale. But what you'll find is that both the powder measure and the powder scale are accurate to within one tenth of a grain. So when you're looking at changing your charge weight to see any noticeable change in your velocities, you're actually gonna to have to change your charge weight by two tenths of a grain in order to really see any measurable difference because you've got a situation where if your powder charge is varying by a tenth of a grain and your powder measure is varying by a tenth of a grain, if you try to increase your charge weight by one tenth, you'll find that the sort of tolerances and variability and inaccuracy of them will kind of cancel each other out and you really won't necessarily see any consistent improvement if you throw one charge and weigh it. Let's say the charge weight that I'm, I've been using with a 230 grain bullet in 45 ACP uh, was 4.1 grains of clays. So if I throw a charge and weigh it and it says 4.1, the next one I weigh could also be 4. Point, show 4.1 on the scale but actually be off a little bit because the, 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 the tolerances of the scale and the measure working together could mean that the charge could actually be a tenth of a grain different than what is reading on the scale. So not until you've increased your charge weight by two grains are you gonna see much of a difference. And of course, it's a lot easier to make a two tenth of a grain uh, difference in your charge weight because it's easier to see it reflected in the scale. Now, it is possible to make smaller changes than that. I remember uh, Steve on an episode said something like, my charge weight is 4.243 grains or something like that. And we went, how the hell could you figure that out? I mean, if, you're, if your scale and your measure are accurate to within a tenth of a grain, how can you get any charge weight that's more accurate than a tenth of a grain? And the way you can do that is to measure more than one charge, believe it or not. So what I'll do while I'm adjusting my press to get it dialed into my kind of uh, into the close to the charge weight that I want, I'll, I'll throw a charge, weigh it, throw another charge, weigh that. And, and after I've weighed three or four charges that seem to be kind of settling down into the zone that I want, then I'll change my powder scale to read 10 charges since the, the we'll call it the error that's built in, not built in, but the, the minimum error that you'll find in the system is a tenth of a grain. That's consistent for weighing one charge or weighing a hundred charges. So if you throw a single charge and weigh it, it the, the resulting number you see on your powder scale could be off by as much as a tenth of a grain. If you throw 10 charges and weigh those, the error is still going to be a tenth of a grain. So if you're looking at making minute little adjustments in your charge weight, weigh more than one charge. So what I'll usually do is I'll weigh single charges until I'm starting to get close. Then for instance, my current charge is 4.1 grains. I'll bump the powder scale up to 41 grains, throw 10 charges, and then weigh that. And, and what you'll see is if you weighed those 10 charges individually, you would see the scale varying by a tenth of a grain from one, as much as a tenth of a grain from one charge to the next. If you throw 10 charges and it's still off by a tenth of a grain, well, you've dialed your load in perfectly. I mean, you're very, you're, you're, you have a variation of one tenth over 10 charges. You're dialed right in. Now, if you throw 10 charges and it, and it shows 40 grains, well, now you're really off by a full tenth of a grain. You, you need to adjust your scale. And so by kind of uh, alternating between single charges and multiple charges, you can dial your load in very accurately. And even if it seems like you're only altering it by a tenth of a grain, which is kind of recommended against because of this, these tolerances and variances and the ability to throw a consistent charge and weigh a consistent charge, remember that that inconsistency of one tenth of a grain carries over to no matter how many individual charges are being weighed at a time. So if you're off by a tenth of a grain, if you're, if you're consistently reading within a tenth of a grain on a single charge, throw 10 charges, and if you're still off by only a tenth of a grain, you've really got your load dialed in. 
but if it shows, let's say five tenths, six tenths, eight tenths, one way or the other, then you can make fine adjustments on your press to dial out that little bit of an inaccuracy. And actually you can get your loads to within uh, a tenth of a grain or less uh, of, of a change in charge weight and consistently do it by just weighing a larger number of charges and then using that consistent one tenth of a grain of variation uh, to your advantage. All right, the trivia question this week. We've got some more prizes to give away, and uh, we do this via trivia questions, of course. And the question this week is, during a match, USPSA match, can you change the color of the fiber optic in your front sight? Can you go from green to red, let's say? Is that legal in USPSA? And uh, just give us a uh, legal or illegal as your answer. Send your answers to powerfactorshow at gmail.com. Check us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash powerfactorshow, and uh, see our website, powerfactorshow.com. Ba-dum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-bum-